Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Nashler's 360 Speaker Series. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith. And today, I'm pleased to introduce artist Michael Dean. The run-up to Michael Dean's show has been a pleasant mystery for most of us at the Nasher. From a few glimpses of new work in the artist's studio to the almost theatrical installation process last week, during which our lower level was obscured by a wall of white curtains. And, speaking as someone who sees a lot of exhibitions come and go, it's a real treat to be surprised. I suspect many of you who came down the stairs today were surprised as well by the way Dean has transformed our gallery space into an otherworldly field of white peopled with cryptic and intense sculptural forms. Dean's work, which often deals with language and the struggle to communicate, has recently been the subject of solo shows at the South London Gallery, the Apple Art Center Amsterdam, and Extra City Kunsthal Antwerp. Dean has been included in group exhibitions at such institutions as the David Roberts Art Foundation, London, the Center for Contemporary Culture at Palazzo Strozzi, Florence, Bergen Kunsthal, Bergen, the Hayward Gallery, London, Palais de Tokyo, Paris, and the Institute of Contemporary Arts, London. This year, Michael Dean has been shortlisted for the 2016 Turner Prize for his recent, so sh excuse me, recent solo shows, Sick Glyphs and the Qualities of Violence. Work from these exhibitions is currently on view at the Tate Britain. Joining Dean in conversation is Nasher Chief Curator Jed Morse, who has been with our institution since its inception and has recently organized major exhibitions featuring Joel Shapiro, Anne Veronica Janssens, Giuseppe Pannone, and Philida Barlow. I look forward to some wonderful insights on this compelling installation, so please join me now in welcoming Michael Dean and Jed Morse. So, uh, pardon the dramatic entrance. There's so many people here this afternoon that we didn't have any seats up here. So, that's a good problem to have. Thank you all. I wanted to echo um, Anna's welcome. Uh, it's always wonderful to have such a crowd here, particularly for the opening of uh, the exhibition. I hope you've had a chance to walk through the show. As Anna mentioned, it's a, it's a really dynamic and engaging installation and one in which you, are, you encounter uh, multiple layers of materials and meaning. And um, we are fortunate to have the artist Michael Dean here with us today to discuss his practice, his work, this exhibition, and uh, much more. I've started off with uh, an overview. It's that incredible view that you get of the entire exhibition from the mezzanine level of, uh, of the stairs. And it just, it gives you a sense of kind of the profusion of, uh, that the show offers. Um, Michael's process is, um, is manifold in that um, there are many elements to it, uh, but it always starts with writing. And you'll see writing in, in various uh, forms throughout the exhibition. And so I wanted to talk a bit about, about your process of writing and then how that is translated into um, more tangible products. So writing for you, um, you know, this is, this is not, um, it, it, it's, it seems somewhat akin to uh, poetry or even stream of consciousness writing. What do you, first of all, what, what starts off uh, writing for you? How do, how do, what is that initial impulse um, to put something down onto paper? And then, and then where do you, how, how do you, how does it um, lead you in different directions? Uh, writing started for me as a way of uh, holding on to moments of intensity, moments of attraction, moments when you find yourself perhaps um, a moment of emptiness that you find your being filling somehow. Um, I'm something like uh, 11 years old, standing on top of a, a pity behind the house, and I'm thinking about the sun and the clouds. Sorry if this is very cheesy, I don't know, but um, I'm 11 years old, so you can, you can give me a break. <laughs> and 
seeing this, the, the sun going down in this huge sky, uh, the structures in the clouds. Uh, I, was, I was aware of a sense of dread that that was changing very quickly in front of me. And uh, I wanted to hold on to that and knew that that was disappearing. So it was my first, in my first impulse was to, uh, was to writing, uh, to find a, find a pen in the house, find an envelope, to try to use what words I had to hold on to that, hold on to that moment. Over the years with time, uh, you have something, something magical happens, something fascinating happens, and you throw lots and lots of words at it. And I found that when I tried to return then to that piece of text, which I wanted to somehow give me that moment again, that I found that there was all of these, all of these, uh, too many words getting in the way, mm -hmm. obfuscated with adole this adolescent magic somehow of wanting to contain everything in every direction. And, uh, but I felt that somehow if I could reduce the writing, uh, to, uh, reduce it to its bare bones, that in some way this would facilitate a, somehow a remembering of that writing uh, as and when you would read it. Um, yes, I can, I can try. I could pull my microphone closer to my mouth, perhaps. <laughs> um, so where am I? Um, Sorry. Oh, no, no. Uh, you, were, you were talking about reducing the writing to kind of the bare bones. <coughs> Yes. Of a memory of the so it's always been a question of finding words, putting together a vocabulary that somehow would uh, produce a circle around that experience in the sense of, and as I said, a, a, a very basic footprint that I would be able to somehow step into without having to negotiate the sovereignty of whoever it was writing the text originally. It's like an empty facility somehow. This is what I was aiming towards with my writing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm writing and I'm using words to hold on to these experiences and I'm thinking very much about how I can get writing into other people's hands because I, I, I want to communicate the... So I want to communicate something. I want to facilitate something in other people. Yeah. Um, I found that... Uh, you know, maybe it's something about the way that we're introduced to, to literature at school or what have you, this kind of idea of the hermeneutical pursuit of trying to interpret and get to the bottom of what someone is specifically communicating to you. Mm -hmm. I always had a problem with this, um, that I always felt that somehow because I came from the wrong culture or just because I was um, um, happy in my ignorance, let's say, mm -hmm. that, uh, that I often felt, felt that I was breaking these works with my interpretation, that it somehow that it was wrong to stand where I was looking at this work, that I needed to negotiate the presence of the author. But when I stood in the world and stood in front of a tree doing this thing and produced, I wanted to produce a vocabulary from a dictionary to, to somehow circle this moment, I, I couldn't fail. I wasn't failing. I wasn't interpreting anything incorrectly. Just to be was enough somehow. And it's that feeling, that's, that's where I want to um, place the work place my writing, try to place it into a moment where the, uh, the reader or the, the viewer, when the work becomes an object, yeah. um, is centered and there's more chance that they can... Uh, I feel when you turn writing into an object, uh, there's more a chance that the viewer can take possession or they're implicated in the physical experience with, with the work. Yeah. You know, the, one, of the, so one of the first manifestations of the writing it are... Um, are the books, and there are a number of books in the exhibition here, um, and you've you've produced a new one specifically for this exhibition. If if you read the um, the introductory text at just outside, it gives you a sense of where the beginning of this exhibition started. And you had said that um, you had come across the information that evolutionarily speaking cacti could be said to have lost true leaves. And that phrase, lost true leaves, really stuck with you. Was, that, was, that, was it um, mulling over the potential suggestions and meanings of that phrase, the impetus for the books and then the sculptures? I, I, as part of this process of trying to have the writing somehow published physically in space, I've been looking at... Um, looking at nature 
thinking about this, uh, a moment of growth, um, thinking about um, uh, the ca cactus, for example, as a fleshy body that has a defense system in order to, to, def to f defend its flesh against a hungry mouth. Um, so as part of looking at this idea of growth and, um, and how I might be able to steal some kind of some mechanisms from nature. Uh, as part of my research, I'm going on the internet and I'm looking up and just trying to kind of, uh, trying to find words, trying to find vocabulary that somehow resonates with this circle in a sense that I'm trying to um, write around and experience. So. Sure. And the book, the book that you wrote for this particular exhibition mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is called Scare Hate. And so, you know, how, how does the, how does, it, how does one go from thinking about, um, you know, um, horticultural evolution, the evolution of the, uh, of, of well, the said, cactus? Essentially, I was looking through Wikipedia and came across this, came across this, this phrase, these three words, lost true leaves. Yeah. There's, there's moments where you're looking through all kinds of information, just looking for that, looking for that one word, which will do the job. Something like Lost True Leaves, I felt like it was a title for a Buddy Holly song that he never got a chance to, to write or something. Occasionally you come across these words which become a diagram for an emotion you hadn't quite been able to somehow hold on to, and there, there it is in a, in a phrase somehow. Um, with, the, with the books, um, sorry. That's all right. So I, I'm, I'm just curious that, you know, is there, I mean, it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a kind of direct link between um, between considering the, the the phrase lost true leaves and then the and then the production of this book um, which is titled scare hate and I'm 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 wondering if if there's a, a, a more kind of circuitous route that leads you from one to the other or, or maybe they well, are unrelated because they're different aspects of what you're taking in in your daily life Yes, I, I mean, I'm very much trying to um, harness something like the, the intertextual. So there's a, 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 se a series of intensities in relation to a, a text that might uh, have something to do with this idea of growth and defense and what you might do unto something in order to produce a certain kind of growth. Yeah. Uh, scare hate came around um, that in many ways I was thinking about the works as memorials to, to moments, memorials to a, to a thought or memorials to this moment of um, wanting uh, like an expletive of wanting to, wanting to, uh, in the face of something shocking or something which is both beautiful or terrible, um, this, this yeah. thing. Um, I, I felt that uh, I was I wanted to make memorials to something, and I was thinking about war memorials, and I was thinking about um, scarecrows. Actually, mm -hmm. this the curious thing about so many war memorials. This kind of almost romantic moment yeah. to think to, to glorify the the the, the courage of of, la, of life going going to die for something um, but thinking about uh, if I wanted to make something like that now in order in relation to war what would it be more taking the idea of a scarecrow or something that would um, facilitate in space that when you saw it it would be like um, it, uh, I don't know if there are any children in the audience other than my own children, so I think I can swear. Like, what the foot, you know, sorry, I would swear. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, like a, a, a scarecrow, a scare war, a scare poverty, uh, a, a, sure. a fuck's sake, this thing that you look at it and it's, uh, it's a fist in the face to, to remind you that you don't want poverty in the world or something like this, or you don't want hate in the world. Right. Um, and this was very much uh, an idea. It kind of spills out in the book as a... I'm looking at graffiti, I'm looking at logos that you find uh, on, on the internet or the em emoticons that we use to communicate specific intensities. Yeah. Um, thinking of those almost as, uh, as uh, if, I, if I could spray paint them with, with black pollen somehow in the air to mm -hmm. somehow write them in that, in that way they exist as um, yeah, pollen in, in, in a space full of strange stamens or something. Yeah, and so actually I'm glad you mentioned these kinds of, of icons that you use to create these um, uh, typographic marks with, with which you, that are, are printed in the books. And, you know, the um, scare hate includes these, you know, this kind of um, uh, telltale heart yeah. of, um, that we're all familiar with. I mean, so these are things that, um, you know, 
come from popular culture. And I, and I, I wanted to also show, you know, there are, some, uh, there are several other books from um, previous works um, in the exhibition. This is All, All Shores, yeah. which you had created for um, the South London Gallery exhibition. And it uses cannabis leaves as the kind of, um, you know, very well-known uh, form to form the letters. But then um, this is um, unfinished notes. Yes. Is that right? Um, and there, there are a variety of, of kinds of these kinds of popular emoticons, you know. And you can see uh, cannabis leaves. These are um, um, these are uh, Bob Marley heads, actually, right here. And then, you know, these kind of Playboy bunnies. Um, and then, but you have these, you know, bricks and coins and and these kinds of guns. So is are you interested in the kind of meeting of these of each of these um, icons, um, and is there or is there a sense of um, wanting to draw from from popular culture in particular? It, it, it was an, an attempt to draw from a very particular culture, and in fact, most of those icons are used um, uh, in East London, where I live. Um, the uh, little specimen baggies that you would buy your drugs in that you see cast found find them on the streets. Sure. Uh, and they use Bob Marley's, they use happy faces, hearts, Kalashnikovs, all of these things to somehow signify in some way some moment of intensity or um, this sense that these little logos were lying around and I was somehow looking to somehow spell out the, a text in, in a somehow... Um, we all understand that it's there but nobody talks about it. Yeah. So if I can use, use that as an image to somehow to communicate and pollinate the text and that seemed to make sense, like harnessing these logos and having the text drifting in the wind. Mm. Um, is that right? Where did we go? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, jumping forward. Um, I could just, we were, I'm sorry, my notes are different from this. Anyway, the, the, the next... The next step in the process is that, is that these texts become embodied. Um, and sometimes the, the sculptures, which are these you know, wonderful, abstract, but human presences, um, are also reminiscent of letters. And in this exhibition, you know, you've, you've actually manufactured um, the, 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 the words of that three that three-word phrase, lost true leaves, um, as sculptures, so lost true and leaves. Um, in terms of, um, you know, when you, when you start to try to embody the, the, the text, um, you know, you've, how do you know or what was what 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 is the impulse? There are many ways to embody a text, um, but you know you've you for this you've turned to elements of um, of the human body, tongues, fists, um, also just the sense of of um, the kind of bodily quality of the material. You know how, how does that um, you know how does that how do those kinds of elements represent? or expand upon the text for you? I mean, it's all part of this sense of trying to de deliver a text in, in space and not, not deliver something which is there to be hermeneutically analyzed, but um, some kind of uh, physical landscape that you as the viewer or the reader indeed are somehow implicated in immediately. Hmm. As to how I come across, how, how I come to, to each word or each work, sorry. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a long process of writing in which I'm ser searching out um, the, um, the possibilities of, of growth uh, um, and what have you some, uh, in all of these works. The, the lost true leaves, its verticality happened by, by virtue of me writing, I was writing the word and crossed it out. And as I crossed it out, the, I somehow crossed it out with an L crossed out these three words with L's. Uh, when that paper was turned on its side, I realized that that L would facilitate a verticality, and, and, and there it was. Um, 
it, a, a possibility to somehow render that text in space without somehow uh, giving you a conclusion as to what it is, but somehow to deliver the text as a as a, as a system of utterances, which in this case are yeah, again, typogra all, uh, typographically informed and relatively legibly delivered, I think. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to, this, this sense of embodying a text, it, I wanted to bring up this early work from, I think this is 2009, when you were, you, you were trying to embody the text and you were using photography at the time. That's right, yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting, this was, a, you were photographing, was this kind of like raw chunks of meat? Yes, this this is a, a loaf of bread. Oh, okay. A loaf of white bread, but it does look kind of meaty. Yeah. Um, but it was very much about yeah, taking something and trying to make the world prismatic, take the world for a face and pass a text f through yeah. it. Um, this this piece of bread uh, uh, was a, a, a photograph taken and printed, and then that photograph is folded uh, according to a typographical rule, and then and it's uh, it, it spells no n o. Uh, there was a series of breads and yes and no, and it was um, in relation to somehow the ridiculousness of uh, of an emotion elicited by a strong yes or a strong no in re in relation to a, a loaf of bread. What does that what does that mean to feel incredibly in, in I don't know, I've looked at a loaf of bread and at a, at a moment of extreme loss. I've looked at a loaf of bread at a moment of extreme happiness. How how silly that this bread has has mirrored this somehow. Yeah. And to kind of to hold that as a moment, I mean, kind of coming back to the show in a, in, in a sense, in terms of trying to hold um, and, and uh, implicate people in an experience, I'm thinking very much about this. Uh, if people under, maybe have had, if they're lucky enough to have had a moment of falling in love, or unluc unlucky enough to have had a moment where you've lost somebody, there's a feeling that somehow the, there were moments where it feels that the whole world is communicating to you with a language that you understand, and in some way. Um, it's so many coincidences or, or what have you and I feel if, I, I don't know, I'm kind of going off on one but that, that's kind of what I'm looking for yeah sorry you know it's uh, a lot of times this this notion of embodying text um, reminds me uh, strangely enough I mean it's um, it reminds me of um, you know the beginning of, of Genesis in the Bible you know in, in the beginning there was the word you know, and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. This idea, you know, so this idea that, um, you know, that words are a generative force, but also something that are, um, um, you know, that, that are physical. They're not abstract. You know, even the language, of course, is, is abstract. There's something, there's something physical and very present about it. And um, your work, I, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of that phrase when I see your work because of the intensity, I think, of the way that you, you, you work with the material and, and how the material embodies that, that sensibility. Um, so we were talking about embodying, um, and there's a, there's a wonderful sense of, of fleshiness um, to uh, to the to the work. Can you talk a little bit about your your process and how you create the the concrete and rebar works? Uh, yes. Um, in many in many cases, it begins with um, of course with a with a word that is cut into um, into a, a flat piece of wood, which is then put together as a corrug in a corrugated fashion to pr uh, produce a mold, which I then f press the cement into into. Um, you know, I'm not really trained as a sculptor. I, didn't, I, I arrived at this essentially because I wanted to I take a, make a piece of writing um, as as physically hardcore, as physically archetypal as possible, and to to give it as, as physical a face. I used concrete because it was cheap and it was you could get. You don't need to you don't need to learn much. Yeah. Sand, water, and cement, and you've you've got something solid. But I have a text that I'm trying to trying to embody. First of all, maybe just as a question of um, taking taking a, a cast from it. But then there's also a sense um, that I might then, once that work is made, I, I might do something do something to it in order to produce a, a, another text. So I might start off with with an L and break it so that it forms an F, mm -hmm. or uh, yeah, 
um, I have all of this word, all of these words, all of this text that I'm, that's that's always there to in, to inform the work. So it's as much about um, starting off with a, with a specific word and then responding then to its physicality. When in my inability to produce one thing, something else happens, and then I'm you know I'm, I'm constantly reading the work and writing it somehow simultaneously. And that, yeah, that kind of that urgency, I guess, comes across. One of the um one of the elements of many of the works are these kind of very simple tongue-shaped forms. And on this work, all of those orange um, elements are kind of tongue-shaped. And it, for me, it makes you very aware of the kind of physicality of how we form words. The forming words in the mouth is akin to forming something, you know, some kind of material in the hand. Um, and you've you've done work that that I think um, more ex it seems to more explicitly deal with that that sense of um, the physicality of forming language and the way that you know you, your tongue fills your mouth sometimes, particularly if you're you know inarticulate or incapable of expressing something. I'm thinking you know specifically of of these works which are from 2014. Um, which seem to be these kind of assemblages of these kind of tongue shapes, um, and they they may be they may be uh, uh, um, kind of writing out letters. I'm not sure. I can't quite tell. But it's this kind of knot of tongues, and then the titles are these kind of guttural utterances, um, U's and N's and H's. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that kind of um, the, the aspect of the work that deals with, with the kind of physicality of speech, but also that kind of sense of not being able to get something out of your mouth. I, or, or just at, at, uh, at that, the, the immediate moment of wanting to say something and it being, being caught in the, the, the strange things that your tongue does against your teeth and your mouth. Yeah. Um, I mean, that it was a... a, a uh, a result of getting my hands dirty with this, this cement, and uh, in order for cement to set, you need to uh, you need to cover it with plastic to slow down the evaporation process. Yeah. And in doing so, finding myself massaging huge amounts of um, wet cement with in, in bin bags gave me um, a, a curious um, uh, idea in relation to meat and flesh, and this idea of speech and urgency, and thinking about. Um, uh, French kissing in the street and how there are no words involved and wanting to, imagining that I could place my work at this point. Yeah. Um, yes, to a great, the, the tongues come in, in and out to a greater or lesser de degree, but essentially it's archetypally in relation to the muscle and an idea of sinew, um, what the plastic facilitates with the cement, a sense of an almost uh, invisible epidermis that somehow there is a body and there are wrinkles and the, there is a... The, there, is a, there was a skin there at, at some point, but now that is, that is gone and that flesh is raw in space with, this, with, this, with the sense of a, uh, the immediacy of an utterance, yeah. albeit a totally solid, heavy, concrete one. <laughs> um, there are, um, there's also this book. Um, in the, uh, the reason I brought up those works is that there, you'll see in the exhibition there, this book lying on the floor, and, and you know, all of these photographs of the exhibition are just photographs I took with my phone yesterday, trying to have some images to work with. But um, if you if you look closely at this book, it's um, it's formatted. It looks like a, a dictionary, um, but you know, every every word in it is just a series of N, N's and H's. Um, so there there are these kind of guttural utterances, and I think it implicates that aspect of the work within within this particular body of work? Yes, I, um, I mean, it's not, I'm not, not, I don't think that I'm so concerned with the failure of language. I think yeah. it does a perfectly good job of enslaving people and setting people free somehow. But and it was more about trying to accommodate, trying to have, have a dictionary, an imaginary dictionary, or a manifest dictionary that would account for, for all sounds, for every sound, an infinite dictionary that goes on. So if you're thinking that you're listening through the walls and you, all you hear is <laughs> is someone fucking or somebody dying, right. or how, that, how I might notate that and, and, and hold it in a, in a dictionary, just to somehow to widen everything. 
Right. Um, and then, you know, those, those kinds of, the, you know, um, vocalizations um, are, are also manifest in the exhibition. Um, and I think the thing that most people will see are these, these kinds of series of looping Fs. And they're, they're not just a representation of a letter. It's, it, it, it's, um, it is a transcription of a sound in that this is, you know, this beautiful kind of lyrical F in, in, um, in rebar in front, of this win in front of the window where you've painted these, these kind of lyrical Fs, which also, you know, take on, you know, the anthropomorphic qualities in a way. Um, but it's meant as a, as to, to, to evoke that sound, that f sound. Yes, and, and, and in many ways, as a, as a, as a gentle F, or yeah. as a staggeringly angry, violent F, or as, yeah. a, as an F that's there in the background while your body F is, doing, is thinking about something else, your emotions are there, F is a, as, as thought clouds, graffiti thought clouds. Yeah. There's a, um, I wanted to show this just because it's very subtle and, and um, people might miss it. Um, and it's one of the things that's so, um, so wonderful about the work is that there's so many details and you, know, you, can, you can walk into the exhibition and be entirely captivated by the kind of, the, the dynamism of, of the overall view but then there are all of these um, um, wonderful little details. And, and here, this is um, kind of a series of, of um, the glass beads, maybe, that, that uh, in the form of this kind of F, F in, in, the, in the front of one of the, yes, the sculptures. To, to my mind, in relation to, to an idea of roots and shoots, that this work was somehow emanating sweat or tears. And even that was somehow coming out. Yeah. Coming yeah, this, that, that work is a, is a huge fuck sake. Right, yeah. But I cast as one huge long piece of concrete, which I then bro broke in the middle um, with fists emanating from its break. Yeah, I, I wonder if I have that. I, I think I just included it. But anyway, yeah, it's yeah. enormous gray sculpture, this kind of, yeah, cluster of fists up at the top. And then at the bottom, uh, there's this little foot. And you've, you've actually put some coins in, in a little uh, dimple in the foot. Yeah, saving for a rainy day or giving it a tip or something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and so you were talking about roots and shoots and that a lot of it comes, a lot of the exhibition comes from that notion. Well, like this idea of um, hunting, hunting for words that I can use in this, in this intertextual diagram of what I was, you know, what, I've gone from the South London show, which was very much about um, an opportunity to to, uh, to cast my work literally against the surface of the streets, yeah. um, using um, using all the surfaces that the urban surfaces that living in London one sees, and I wanted to I had a, an opportunity to deal with a very sp site specific audience, shall yeah. we say? Um, in in this case, um, in, in in search for this text, I came across the the in looking at growth. At some point, as, as many people might, if you've got a series of good dictionaries, you'll come across eventually the meristem, this idea of um, of, uh, of the moment in the plant, the moment where it, it somehow its its cells know that it will become something else. This moment of cell cell division and cell differentiation, mm -hmm. and again, this idea of uh, division and differentiation, and this idea that something is growing at exactly this point, um, was another text that another series of words which. Couldn't couldn't leave the room once they'd somehow been uttered or, or brought into the circle. Um, there are two places where this happens. Uh, there's the root and there's the shoot, and of course, then these these are. Me mama was talked about root and shooting cowboys, but in, here I am going to to, uh, to Dallas. But quite <laughs> apart from that, think, thinking about roots and, and shoots in relation in, in relation to an idea of um, what one might do to a to a biological body in order to make it more or less. And so the, the space is divided into a, to a light and dark, and the fleshy guys that have the light, and the guys who are not in the light, they have, they have, they have roots and shoots, and they're, they're either going or they're coming away from, right. from a hope of having that thing. I've got a number of images. So the, um, uh, this work, which has, seems to be budding these blue hands. Um, um, 
I usually don't do this, but to quote Wittgenstein, right? <laughs> uh, to think about like the limits limits of my language or the limits of my world. And I was thinking about like I'm I'm coming to America, and the, the limits of my world when I get here will be my family in a sense. I'm bringing them here. We're going to have a holiday after this. I hope. Yeah. I was thinking. Um, the reason I say that is because all of the fists, they're, they're all casts of my family's fists. So the small fists are my young child's and, and the largest, strongest fist, of course, are my wife's fist and then my fist slightly <laughs> behind um, and, and, and so on. So, yeah. And then, of course, these kind of spiky also these emanations, wooden, uh, you know, which are yeah. crossed fingers. Yeah, again, they're all cast from my, from, from my family. Yeah. Um, there are many works in the show, the Red Family, the Green Family, I refer to them as, although they're not titled as such. Yeah. Um, they take their dimensions also from, from my family and thinking about how I, how I can situate my limits in space, yes. Right. I mean, there's, an, there's um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting that, that those works um, come from, you know, not only the architecture of, of the body, but, you know, um, uh, but a, a, very, a very kind of personal and intimate place so that, it seems to reinforce this sense that that language and communication, <laughs> even though it's it, it, it tends to broaden our 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 worlds, it, it it always comes back to kind of the personal and the intimate. Absolutely. Um, yeah, trying trying to, they're trying to produce a situation in which the viewer knows that it actually matters that they've walked in through the door that somehow that they're to blame for the meaning that they invent when they're standing in, in my exhibition and it's not my fault somehow. Um, <laughs> this is the difficult thing to communicate. Um, so, yeah, we were just talking about this idea of scale and I, here's one of the kind of family groups. Um, and so you've got um, you and uh, your wife and your, your two kids. The heights are, are measured in that way. And then also... Um, you know, you'll see other groups, groups of four, where, where the, the works are of different heights. Um, and there are suggestions of, you know, it's, it's, it's extraordinary how um, th these kinds of, you know, simple geometric or amorphous vertical forms can suggest human bodies. I mean, how... Just, just as it's how it's, it's, it's insanely crazy that, that these bones and this bit of flesh and blood contains this a soul and a, and a hope and dream and all of, all of that stuff. Yeah. This idea to try to address this idea that just by taking the dimensions of my family that I can somehow have that concrete animate and produce the emotional relationship. It's somehow, it's, it's inherently there and I feel like we, in a sense, yeah, one is again implicated in that sense of emotion somehow. Um, let me make sure. Where was I going with this? <laughs> but uh, I think organic, yes. And oh, this was the dark and light. This was the photo that where you can see, you know, on the right side of the photograph, um, there's more light, and on the left side, it's dark, and you can see the kind of fulsomeness of the forms and the colors of the forms on the right, and then. And then you know the the much kind of spindlier forms on the left. But this, I, I wanted to ask you about you know Brazil. It was we had, we had talked about um, the impact that Brazil had had on you, and this is a photograph of an exhibition you did at uh, at Mendes Wood. Yeah. Um, well, it was always it's always been at the back. Of, it was always this idea of how can I steal the phenomenological fatherlessness of nature somehow to have this. This this thing that is that is emanated, and how, to, how that might produce autonomy in, in in the viewer, you know, to steal it, and so you can have that stand in front of the tree moment kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But and have it human-handed that I'm somehow that I'm making it making it myself. Going to Brazil was, um, what can I say? I mean, just na nature is so aggressive in a, in the most incredible, beautiful way. It's so it's so strong, and it's there very much as an equal force with. Lots of tropical modernism, which of course all of that concrete stuff turns me on now that I'm totally yeah. immersed in this stuff. Um, but certainly, yeah, just just seeing the exuberance of forms, the, possi the possibility in 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 growth. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm in London. You've got a few weeds. Uh, occasionally, when it, when Newcastle, maybe some some uh, some wheat might find its way and grow grow in the street. But you know, I, 
didn't really have that much access to nature as such. Yeah. Certainly not on the level of, of um, Brazil like that. Yeah. And that, yeah, that punched me in the face or gave me a kick up the arse and that was, that was a massive spike in my um, physical possibilities, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you were talking about um, growing up in Newcastle and at, at the beginning of our conversation, you, 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 you mentioned, you know, um, you're standing on a hill overlooking the pity, you know, your pity. Pity. Yeah. And I, for, for, the, for the audience here in Dallas, they might, they might not recognize what, what you're talking about. Um, oh, uh, maybe you've heard of taken, taken coals to Newcastle. Uh, yes. There was, there, was a, there was a lot of coal mining yeah. for a long time, and uh, the, the, the legacy of that, or a, a series of pit heaps behind council estates, yeah. um, our own little human-handed human hill that yeah. gives you a vantage point above the So the, above the, the earth that was excavated out of the pit created this mound. Exactly, which, which means that nobody can work, develop it, and so it just becomes this, this little moment of, of hilly grass, yeah. yeah, and an otherwise gray concrete in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, um, the, there's a, the, you're um, growing up in Newcastle had, uh, it sounds like a profound impact on you, um, particularly in, in, this, in this kind of interest in writing and books. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, about what that was like and, and why books are, you know, are, are so important. About why books are so important? Um, I mean, I learned a lot from growing up in Newcastle about the sense of like something being hyper-authorial or things people would leave behind and an idea that somehow I was free to, to author them and develop my own relationship to them. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I was writing my heart out for a long time and was aware that there were things... Um, you know, I'd heard, the, heard them talk about it on the telly, things like literature and poetry. Um, I went to find it in the libraries, but unfortunately they'd closed our libraries because there wasn't enough money, apparently, things like this. A sense of a moment in your young life where you, you want desperately to immerse yourself in a context of something, to, to feel that it's denied. Um, in my case, has given me an extraordinarily large chip on my shoulder, but um, it's also given me... Um, uh, a, a direction in a, in, a, in a sense to, yeah, in a, perhaps in a, in a silly, in my own way to, to, to prove that it's possible. I, I, was, I, was, I was working before I knew about continental philosophy and, and, I, and I continue to work now that I know continental philosophy exists, but I don't necessarily utilize its, um, its footnotes to canonize my ideas or so. Sure, sure. There are oftentimes, um, well, sometimes in the works, there are, there are, um, there seem to be these, these kind of strong humanistic but political statements. So this is um, uh, an ex this is from the, the Quality of Violence exhibition at the De Apple Arts Center in Amsterdam um, with all of these, um, all of these Euro scents on the floor. Can, can you talk about the origin of this work and what it's, what it's about? Uh, the title of that work is, um, I, I'm too nervous to be able to remember it. I've, I, I printed it out if you, let's see, where is it? Yeah. <laughs> ah, yes, United Kingdom poverty line of 16,700 pounds sterling, translated in an exchange rate of 1.27 on Christmas Day 2014 into 2,120,900 euro cents. Thinking about qualities of violence and thinking about um, uh, the, uh, an idea of an idea of poverty being determined in relation to what everybody else is earning, um, minus the twenty percent or what have you, in order to figure out what the poverty line is. Coming as I do from, um, uh, 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 get, sorry, get my violins out, but from a poor background, uh, there's a lot of people I know who exist and have always existed, including myself, on, on a lot less than that for a long time. Um, I, I translated it on Christmas Day to just give it that slight little romantic, ridiculous twist somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, to translate it was a, 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 it's a, a work that I went on to, to, to realise at the, at the Tate in pennies. Yeah. And that had been my initial intention. But I didn't want to... Um, also, it's quite a political thing to, to rock up in Amsterdam with 
two million pennies as a, you know, I, I, I thought I'd play it safe and do the, the Eurocent thing, which became a painful um, exercise because they don't really use them as such, and so we had to gather them from from every other European nation and bring and bring them to oh to Netherlands. So it actually cost a lot of money to produce, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, it's a filthy amount. It's a it's a horrible amount. It's a disgraceful concept. It's uh, it's a it, it's a it, it's an experience. Um, I felt that I could manifest it physically, throw it down on the floor like a, um, a, dis a disgusting floor. The, you see a pillar in the centre. Yeah. Um, I, I had, for me, you know, it was an idea that it had lifted up its flesh so that it, it, it didn't want its meat to touch this dirty, stinking amount. You, what you don't see are the windows that shine into that space. Mm -hmm. And so the temperature was always, it was very warm and it, and it stunk the entire exhibition out with the smell of a million people having touched something. Yeah. Some say money is dirty, maybe they're right. It's interesting, you know, it's a, um, you know, because the way that l language often is an abstract, an abstraction that nonetheless um, translates and makes tangible certain things around us. You know, there's this, you know, this also kind of translates, um, you know, the notion of, of subsistence, of, you know, you know, bare subsistence into something that's incredibly tangible and that everyone is is familiar with and just kind of, you know, doesn't think anything about and makes it makes it physical and tangible and, and in this case, an incredibly powerful um, um, experience of that of that. Kind I mean, it was a quite a, a meaningful amount for me. Yeah. Um, but that didn't seem to change the fact that people felt like um, I don't know, was it Donald Duck's uncle or something, and people would jump in it and celebrate uh, and dive and McDuck, yes. this yeah. idea that they were having amazing being fooled by the glitter of this dirty cash and right right well i mean a, a the amount is, is 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 significant but you know the penny it'd be just being kind of the smallest unit of that yeah. um, and one penny being insignificant but when it's expressed as um, as um, you know as a mass then you can really see you know what it's limits is. perhaps yeah yeah um, Let's see. I also wanted to talk a bit about um, the exhibition at South London Gallery um, because it was um, it was an extraordinary exhibition for a number of reasons. Um, one of the surprising things was the kind of um, profusion or of you know the variety of forms that that attended the, the exhibition. Um, and the other is is the kind of um, the way that it, that you had installed it, such that um, uh, you were denying people entry. Um, so you can't. It's difficult to see in this slide, but that's the main entrance to the exhibition, and that door was blocked um, by a series of um, corrugated aluminum barriers um, that you had erected, and that forced the viewer to go outside through the garden of the South London Gallery and through the, um, the back door of the space to, to enter the exhibition. Um, and that had a very powerful effect, just simply moving um, the, you know, m making it a challenge to go and see that, that installation. And then inside were, were all of these kinds of, um, um, you know, very, um, I don't know, you know, you, you had a, there was, I felt an extraordinary empathy for those kinds of abstract forms that nonetheless were reminiscent of figures and they had a sense of flesh, but also, you know, they were leaning on each other and um, um, often kind of bound together um, with rubber ties or zip ties and in, and in crude ways. Um, you know, th there was, it's, um, and you had mentioned to me that um, in some ways it was a reaction to the refugee crisis that Europe was facing at the, at the moment. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about that exhibition because I'm sure it, it, it's, it, it goes well beyond that. Uh, at its centre is, is, a, is a text 
all shores. Um, there was a moment a long time ago, I'm standing looking at the sea and I turn around and I, I'm looking, I look at the, the land and thinking about the shore and how that might be a model for touching, how this, these two surfaces are constantly touching one another. I then expanded on this idea of, 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 of the shore, uh, the, uh, an idea of shoring, of uh, an idea of being shored, how one describes uh, the shore, the shore shores, the shore shores, shored, shoring shores, or the shore shores, shoring, shoring, or shoring, shoring, or shores, shore, shoring, sh I could, no, I won't keep going, but um, <laughs> this, this kind of, this, potentially endless loop of what shores do and how uh, something being sh short, I'll, I'll get lost in it if I do that again. <laughs> but um, I, all of these works were somehow being pollinated in this endless cycle uh, and the coincidence of, of me thinking about my family and empathising with um, a family who's born on the other side of the sea or on the other side of the wall or how in, how in fact just, just to exist is somehow to exist on one, to one, on one side or the other. Um, I wanted to somehow write, it's somehow writing the shores and the shoring and the, the shored shores in, into each of those works. Many of them are failing in relation to the weight that they're shoring or, or have indeed once shored or is being shored upon them. Um, and that sense of growing, growing out of that was very important. There was the legacy also of wanting to manifest works which relate to my, to my body. And I try to. Um, I, I need to be there at the birth of every work, and so I, I make, of course, all of the works myself. And there's a limit to what I'm able to to mix, and um, that that also kind of restricts the size of the works. But yes, it was very much about somehow trying to produce, trying to have this text func function function to find that one would find shores in in all experiences of the works. Um, in relation to how they've blocked the entrance, uh, there were eye holes also in this in this. Um, in this blockage so that there was a sense that when you had found your way into the exhibition you were always also being watched by people who were thinking well how how have you got in there mm -hmm. and there's this sense of um, a constant a, a discomfort it's it's remarkable how with a degree of discomfort you can make people feel more present yeah. so having uh, centering them in this way yeah the, I, I guess a lot of the works store a lot of frustration and a lot of uh, the urgency of manifesting themselves in space with a sense of what's what's the point or or being chained or locked or trained to something which doesn't exist anymore and that they're expected to continue to grow or uh, yeah a vocabulary of of of, a, of life experience really and trying to compete with the outside world in relation to getting text into people's hands so they're reading it and experiencing it without even without it being aware of it somehow. Yeah. And this was also an exhibition where, um, you know, it was at least the first time that I saw this expansion of the vocabulary to include your family um, in that, you know, there were these kind of groups of fours at various heights and then there were also the, the casts of fists in this exhibition. Um, and, um, and then, oh, that's right. And then also the, the white floor. And I, w I wonder if you can talk about, you know, what, what the white floor, what you feel it does for, for the exhibition, both there and, and also here at, at the Nasher. Um. And I, an idea of having, of, of building these glyphs, building this, building these sculpted marks, these calligraphic eruptions in in the space. Uh, in the in the early days when I was making work and couldn't afford to, sh to I wasn't showing it anywhere. I would I set up a white background and made works out of sticks and balloons, always on this white background as a as a way to quickly take a photograph of a work mm -hmm. and to print it out and to somehow uh, to get it back into the book to get it back into the body of the book as a, as a, as a thin black mark. Yeah. It was always this idea that somehow uh, that finding, placing the work onto the, into this, the expanse of a, of, a, of a white space was addressing, was placing the work back into this white page. And uh, it was essentially that, to, to produce a large white space in which I could um, arrive at the, 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 the South London Gallery with a, a series of, of components 
a box full of notes and to 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 write out those works in space and to demonstrate in each case um, an element you know an element taken from this shorey text. Yeah. But it was it was just a, it was um, what, I mean I'm, I'm it's kind of like a, a gift also that I give to myself because if you. Yeah, you you wouldn't have seen my studio. My, st I'm very lucky to have um, a dodgy garden in the middle of um, a bunch of houses. Uh, yeah. So when I make these works, they're almost themselves. They're components. They're growing out amongst the weeds that I'm building them in. Uh, so to have this one clear, clarifying moment, a compositional uh, situation in which I'm able to kind of develop a crescendo and mm -hmm. deliver that intensity with that work, in which a series of elements portray that moment of its shoring or being shored or what have you. Yeah, um, yeah that's what happened. I, the white space has, has been killing me ever since this. I like that I can make this thing and it, it, it yeah, it really is uh, placing a physical thing on a, on a white, on a physical white page for me somehow. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to talk about the, in Lost True Leaves, the marking of the windows, um, and what what brought that on, and then also the kinds of associations that 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 it brings up. Yes, perhaps it's lost in the in the cultural translation. And we we whitewash windows in England when a shop is closing down, uh, for example. When, when a shop, when there are there are. I don't know if you've heard about the Brexit, but there's lots of shops closing down. Uh, it has been for quite some time, but. Um, this idea of a, a, nat a natural calligraphy, an accidental calligraphy, when someone is hurriedly uh, blanking out the glass, yeah. um, that the possibility that again, that somehow in, the, in this moment you, you might find that the, it, it's somehow spelling by some kind of uh, yeah, it's it, like it's in it's in the air and and, and uh, it contaminates the gestures like a mindless gesture. That's something that's happening when he's thinking of something else. Mm -hmm. I of course. The space is uh, it's, it, it, an incredible space. Uh, it's an incredibly open-hearted space. You see it, and it gives itself to you immediately. So I, I, it was very important for me to also to slow down the process of um, consuming all of the works. Mm -hmm. um, at first, my, I was going to think I was thinking about how my blackout uh, whitewash the entire windows, but it was important. I could just do it with with my body as, as tall as I could reach. <coughs> And I this, tried to delay this moment with the, with the eye holes, which again correspond with my family's eye holes, yeah. to try to also produce this moment where people can be in the space and be more aware of themselves when they're aware that there are eyes looking through them at themselves. It also informed the installation of the, the family in relation to somehow looking through those holes and associating the view with, with each character in, mm -hmm. in the show. Yeah. The... Um, the um, it, one of the interesting things from the, from the uh, from the mezzanine level, when you when you look down, you can just see the tops of a few of the works in the space, but it 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 does feel like this kind of you know white picket fence around a secret garden right. in in some strange way. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. Just a comment, not a question. <laughs> um, Ah, here they are. Here, these are the eye holes. So you can see, um, you know, this is taken from the inside of the space, and you know the eye holes that were that were cut out of the um, at ver at the heights of Michael and his family, and then you know the view into the space through those eye holes. It's actually impossible to take a photograph, a really accurate photograph, because <laughs> photography doesn't mimic stereoscopic. Um, <laughs> um, and then, the, yeah, there's the view from, from up above. So um, what's, you know, you've got um, the, the De Appel exhibition and the um, South London Gallery exhibition were, um, you know, were, were, the, were the exhibitions for which you were nominated uh, for the Turner Prize, yeah. and that's uh, that's coming up, um, and then uh, you've got your 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 trip 
uh, after this. Yes, indeed. Uh, here in the states, and then what? What? What next? What's? What should we? What do you have a sense of what comes next? Or are you do you kind of gladly taking a, a, a breath before going on to the next thing? Well, I, I, my friends keep telling me that I need to take a break, but um, my wife keeps telling me I need to take a break. No, uh, yes, it's, it's difficult. After, after such a show, I'm left with as many questions as I have answers somehow. There's a whole new body of work which is, is somehow being signaled to me yeah. um, after having manifested that. I need to, what I need to do now is try to take a break from it and to, uh, to come back and to somehow test it in my mind, to come back to the images, of course, um, and, 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 and in the hope that it's worked and that it's contained some of those intensities that led me to kind of crescendo the space, the work in, in, in space somehow. But um, I'm very interested in an idea of pub uh, public work public work and placing the work in a, in a public situation yeah. which, uh, where people can experience it before they've been told that it's art. A sense that they, they can touch it and uh, that, that question mark. There's, there's a lot of power in that. So yeah. Keep your eyes open. <laughs> Good. Um, why don't we take just a, a couple of questions from the audience. And so if you, if you have anything that you'd like to ask of, of either Michael or I. Yes. I'm curious to know, I don't know why it occurred to me, but my question is why and what attracted you to introducing color into your work? But it reminds me of when my mother would make, she had those three or four primary colors that you could add food color into to make it. And, it, it. and to me, the kind of reminds me of play which is a child's life story. It doesn't have to do with writing, which is just what you talked about. How did you choose the colors, and when did you introduce color into your work? Um, I can say that I started to introduce color into my work when they started selling it on Amazon, when you could kind of buy it on the on the on the internet without having to um, without having to be a professional. And you know, I, I, I keep myself to myself. I don't <laughs> I don't know many people who are making this stuff. I um, I'd experimented before with pigment using. Um, you know, artists' pigment that would be used for painting with devastating results in the sense that it, it looked like it would last forever, but when you touched it, it would crumble and fall apart. So then suddenly finding that I had that, I was... Uh, was it's a with exactly, it's a specific um, concrete that works with this calcium aluminate. And, um, of course, suddenly you're given a palette. I've been very careful. I've tried to be careful not to just be like, oh my God, yellow, oh my God, blue. But um, there was a sense it started off, for example, with the family. Um, I wanted to present my, my, my family in a space and then I was thinking about ethnicity and wanting to somehow invite the possibility that anybody can look at this work, not just like some white family walking around in a white space. And so I felt I, if, I, if I peeled our skin off, we would just exist as this kind of, as, as pink muscle aren't we all under, on, underneath this? And um, so, so came the red, um, the green in relation to a shoot, uh, but the blue is a, is a it, it's somehow it's, it's so not nature, but the idea to pretend that it is in the sense of a human nature, I'm excited, excited by. Okay, welcome. Anyone else? Yes. Have you ever employed this light and dark kind of shift before in any of the work? So what about the space made you want to employ like light on one side and dark? Um, in the in my previous um, major shows, like this show at the Apple South London and at, and at the Tate, um, and in most of my solo moments. Uh, I try to use natural light in the gallery, just the light, turn all of the lights, take all of the lights away and just have the light that comes in from outside in this kind of want, in this way of wanting to somehow connect with the outside world. If you go to see it on a sunny day, then lucky you. If you see it on a cloudy day, well, you've got to come back. Um, and so then having this wonderful space in the belly of the whale, there isn't that much... Uh, I, stole, I, I stole that from Lucia. Actually, she said that yesterday, the belly of the whale. Um, <laughs> There is no natural light, or there is very little, and so then I, I was scared by how glorious the white space looked with all of the lights on. That it's 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 not about creating it like a trick. You know, anything might look good if you place it in this white space. It's why photographers and fashion photographers use it all, or what have you. But um, I needed to essentially to produce like an an emotion or an effect 
and that corresponded with this idea of roots and shoots. And so um, th there it is in the sense of being able to have something in the daylight and in the dark. Yeah, I needed to produce that theatre to kind of, to give it something. Okay, well, we can also continue the conversation uh, uh, with a glass of wine. So thank you all for joining us and please stay with us and join us for a...